Joel, good to have you with us. Uh, let's begin by having you describe this magic formula that uh, enables you to do so well in the stock market. And uh, you actually wrote a book on it, The Little Book That Beats the Market. And this was several years ago, and you're still alive and you're still beating the market. So uh, can you describe it for us, please? Sure, it's really uh, basic uh, value investing, uh, you know, based on both Benjamin Graham and, and, and uh, Warren Buffett. Um, I started investing back in the early 80s, and we were quite successful for a period of time. And some of the things that I teach over at Columbia and, and uh, the reasons why I think we were able to make money, I, I kind of put down in this book. And, and there were two main principles, one from Graham, one from Buffett. Uh, Graham's was... Uh, Figure out what something's worth and pay a lot less for it. You know, so if you can buy it cheap, uh, that's a good thing. And so we measure cheap by getting a lot of earnings for the price we pay. Uh, so it's really the inverse of the P/E ratio, uh, earnings to price. We don't use simple earnings and we don't use simple price, but that's the same concept. Um, we take into account different tax rates and different uh, amount of debt that companies have and things of that nature. But basically, all we're trying to do is get a lot Just of earnings. Quickly for the describe price we pay. enterprise value as you see it. Right. So uh, the concept what we look at is EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, to take out companies with different amounts of debt and tax levels, which is earnings before interest and taxes. And we compare that to enterprise value, which is basically the stock price plus the amount of debt per share that a company has. So we're just sort of leveling the playing field uh, for companies that take on debt and companies that don't. But when you buy a, a a share of stock, what you're really doing is uh, paying for the equity, but you're also assuming the debt that the company took on. So we're taking that into account. But really all we're doing is comparing the earnings of a company to the price that we're paying. Uh, the other concept, uh, sort of what Warren Buffett brought to the table, I think, from his teacher Ben Graham was, well, cheap is great, but if I can buy something that's also good uh, in addition to cheap, so if I can buy a good company at a cheap price, that's even better than just looking at cheap alone. And so we use a concept uh, which, which is return on uh, tangible capital, really also learned from Buffett, which uh, basically says a business to operate needs working capital and it needs um, fixed assets. Uh, and the question is, how well does a company turn that working capital and fixed assets into earnings? So we compare earnings to net working capital plus fixed assets to see what kind of return on tangible capital capital a, a company can earn. So the higher the better. I gave an example in the book. Uh, I was actually uh, trying to explain this concept to my son and we were going to school one day and... Uh, the gum? Yes, and we saw, and we saw uh, one of his friends and you know my son tar starts telling me the story that his, uh, his friend goes to the candy store every morning, buys a few packs of gum. He pays 25 cents for a pack. There's five sticks of gum in a pack. And in school, since it's tough to get the gum, he can sell each stick for about 25 cents each. So he collects a dollar and a quarter for a pack that he paid a quarter for, and he earns a dollar uh, for each pack that he can sell in school. So he's making 3 to $5 a day, you know, just selling gum in school. Uh, so I told my son, imagine that uh, this uh, uh, kid, Jason, grows up, and he opens a gum store and calls it Jason's Gum Store. And each one of those gum stores costs $400,000 to open for inventory, for the uh, displays, and the, and the store itself, it's $400,000. Each year that store earns $200,000. So we look at that as a 50% return on capital. If he can lay out $400,000 once and, and it spins out $200,000 a year, that's a 50% return on capital for each store that he can open. Then I told my son to imagine another store. We'll call it Just Broccoli, and all it sells is broccoli. And it still costs, unfortunately, $400,000 to open that store, but each year that store only earns, don't ask me how, $10,000 a year. <laughs> and that, we said $10,000 divided by $400,000 is a 2.5% return on capital. And when we rank businesses, we say 50% return on capital is better than a 2.5% return on capital. So what we did for the, what I called the magic formula in the book, is we rank all companies based on their return on capital. And we also rank all companies based on how cheaply we can buy them relative to their earnings. The more earnings, the better. Then we combine those rankings, and the companies that have the best combination of that ranking go to the top. So we're not looking for the cheapest company. We're not looking for the highest return on capital company. We're looking for the companies that have the best combination of those two attributes. And uh, this is what I've been teaching for years and years. 
Uh, but I never really had a proof of concept, really. I never statistically proved out, does this make sense? And so about seven or eight years ago, I started a project, you know, had the resources to start a project to actually go back and test, what if we did this on a consistent basis over time? And uh, the way it worked out was that uh, you could basically, uh, if you just bought the top stocks, you know, and, and, and we're talking, you know, top thousand stocks, you could basically double the returns of the S&P 500, just sticking with this formula over a, a long how, period how, of time. Uh, by the way, how large is the universe? How, what, what kind of liquidity factors do you want? Right. So we looked at the, uh, we did two tests. We did smaller cap stocks, you know, probably the top uh, 3,500 stocks. But then we said, well, what if you can't really buy these? So we also did a study, which I just mentioned, on the top 1,000 companies, the largest 1,000 companies roughly, usually about 20% of the actual publicly traded universe. How do you account for quality of earnings and uh, things like financial companies, which uh, once looked very cheap in uh, 2006, 2007, but uh, there was a reason why they were cheap. Right. Well, that, that's a good uh, point, and it's, it's going to be tough for me to answer because one thing, we, we look at EBIT as one of our earnings, earnings before interest and taxes. If you look at a bank before interest, it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. So in our analysis, we, we eliminated uh, certain types of companies, uh, really two types. One were financials. They're different animals, and, and the met, there's nothing wrong with investing in financials in general, but our metrics don't cover financials. They're, they're kind of viewed in a different way, and uh, this formula does not apply to them. I wrote the book in 2005, not anticipating any financial crisis or anything like that. It was really eliminated because they weren't really appropriate for financials. The other are utilities because uh, utilities are regulated entities where their returns are regulated. They're not really capitalist companies, and, and so they don't follow the same rules. Uh, as what we're looking for. So we also eliminated those in our study. It's just not appropriate, the, the measures we were using. So with the exception of those two. Now, over the time period that we looked at back to 1988 through, uh, you know, this year, uh, if you take out financials or include financials, the return of the S&P would have been uh, within one-tenth of a percent the same. So the results are pretty robust, meaning, uh, uh, you know, it didn't matter whether we used financials or not. I think the most exciting thing we found in our research, though, was not that this just worked for finding the best stocks. We said, well, maybe you get lucky picking the top 30 stocks that, that meet these criteria. So we actually did an experiment, and we divided uh, the top 2,500 companies into deciles. The, the best 250, according to our formula, mm -hmm. the next 250, according to our formula, the next 250, and we so tested this over 18 the years. Line. And what actually happened was the same thing, meaning the top decile beat the second decile, beat the third decile, all the way down to the tenth decile in order. So we're doing something very powerful here. We're sort of saying which group of stocks will do best next year. That's kind of valuable information if you can put together a group of stocks and say which ones will do the best. And, um, you know, this followed through no matter how large the companies we use. So it's, it's very reproducible. Uh, you know, for institutions or, you know, for a great many individuals. Uh, obviously, individuals have an advantage because they can buy smaller stocks, but even institutions can take advantage of this. Now, uh, you've had actual experience with this now? Uh, well, yes. Well, well, two things. One, I wrote the book five years ago. So we actually did a test. And uh, over the last, we, we, uh, we set up a, a, a new test uh, to update the book. Over the last 10 years, we opened a firm called Formula Investing to, uh, because I got so many emails from people saying, thanks so much for writing a book, thanks so much for the formula, but can you just do this for me? So we got enough of those, and I teamed up with a gentleman named Blake Darcy, who founded DLJ Direct, and we put together a firm to make it easy for people to do this. Um, and, and we did a study saying if you followed this principle on the, the largest 20% of stocks over the last 10 years, what would have happened? So the, the S&P was actually down over the last 10 years, ending September. Uh, if you had followed the strategy, you would have been up about 288%, according to our study, which is almost quadrupling your money during a period where the market was, was down. More importantly, I wrote the book five years ago. So during the last five years, uh, this also continued to do very well, uh, meaning the market was only up about 5% during that period. And following the strategy, you would have been up about 72%. So you would have beaten the market by more than 10% a year during that period. After now, I gave away the secret. Now, uh, now that you're applying it yourself, do you think as more and more people apply it that it's going to become less effective? No, I think like... The, the, 
this is really just a, a twist on on value investing, and people have known for years. Uh, you know, and there were studies been done for the last forty years on whether it's low PE investing or low price book investing or whatever. And these things work over time. Uh, and if I had written a formula up that worked every week and every month and every year, uh, it would stop working. Uh, fortunately, this formula is not so great. And there are, uh, you know, during we'll explain the... that uh, you can have years where it's not going to work. Right. So in other words, over the last 22 years, there have been one-year periods, two-year periods, and occasional three-year periods.